Welcome to another deep dive, everyone. Today, um, we're going to be talking about all sorts of eukaryotic microbes, parasites and fungi and algae and lichens. Sounds fun. It's going to be a good one, I think. Mm -hmm. We're using uh, microbiology, Q&A 5, the eukaryotes of microbiology as our source. Okay. And so let's just dive right into it. These tiny organisms, they can have such a big impact on us and the environment. Oh, yeah, for sure. And when we think of microbes, we don't always think of eukaryotes, right? We think of bacteria and viruses. Yeah, most people think of those first, for sure. But eukaryotes, they're really a whole different ballgame. Definitely. And when you think about parasites, too, right? a lot of people just immediately think of something negative. Yeah, of course. But it's a really diverse world out there, even on a microscopic level. Absolutely. And you know, a great example is protists. Okay. They, they really include everything from helpful algae that produce oxygen. Oh, wow. To uh, those nasty parasites that cause diseases like malaria. Like malaria. Yeah. And speaking of protests, um, the way that we classify them is actually changing. It is. Scientists are kind of moving away from the kingdom protista mm -hmm. because it's kind of like this, you know, like we're trying to group apples and oranges and bananas together. Yeah. Just because they're fruits. Yeah. You know? It doesn't really capture right. all of their unique characteristics. Exactly. Yeah, it's like a scientific reorganization. Yeah. They're realizing the old system wasn't that accurate. Yeah. The old system was what we call polyphyletic. Okay. Meaning it groups organisms together that didn't share a recent common ancestor. I see. It's like, you know, putting penguins and eagles in the same category. Right. Just because they both have wings. Oh, okay. So it's like analogous characteristics, not homologous characteristics. Precisely. Got it. Yeah. Even with all of these changes, there are still some parasites out there. Oh, yeah. That definitely give us a reason to be cautious. For sure. Like Plasmodium, the parasite that is responsible for malaria. Right. Or Giardia. Oh, Giardia. Which can really ruin a camping trip yeah. if you accidentally drink some contaminated water. Absolutely. It's definitely one of those less pleasant members of the microbial world. Yeah. But, you know, understanding their life cycles can really help us yeah. make safer choices. Of course. So, for instance, you know, knowing how Giardia spreads through contaminated water right. can remind us to treat our water properly when hiking or camping. Right. It's all about being informed. Exactly. And, you know, speaking of parasites that can really make an impact, what about those parasitic worms? Oh, the worms. Like, I remember learning about tapeworms in biology class. Oh, yeah. And how they can get so long. Oh, yeah, they can get very long. Yeah. Those are the helminths. Okay. And even though they can get pretty large, I mean, some tapeworms can grow to be over 30 feet long. Wow. They're still studied in microbiology. Okay. Because we often identify them by their microscopic eggs and larvae. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So like a parasite longer than your car. It's wild, isn't it? Living inside of a host. Yeah. This just goes to show how adaptable these organisms can be mm -hmm. and why understanding those life cycles is just crucial for effective treatment. 30 feet. That's longer than my living room. That's pretty long. Yeah. Puts things in perspective. It does. And think about schistosoma. Yes. Schistosoma. The worm that causes schistosomiasis. Mm -hmm. Millions of people are infected worldwide. Yeah. It's a big problem. And by understanding its life cycle. Right. And how it spreads through contaminated water. Yes. We exactly. can develop better prevention strategies. Exactly. Like improving sanitation mm -hmm. and access to clean water. Exactly. So it's not just about individual health. Right. It's about global health initiatives, too. Absolutely. And that kind of brings us to another fascinating group of eukaryotic microbes. Okay. Fungi. Fungi. Yeah. Okay. From microscopic yeasts that we use in baking You're right. to those giant mushrooms popping up in forests. I love mushrooms. They really come in all oh. shapes and sizes. Yeah. They do. And their diversity is really reflected in how we classify them. Yep. You know, they're divided into several groups based on their reproductive structures and other characteristics. So even though we just see a mushroom, like there's a whole world going on underneath the surface. Exactly. Yeah. And what I find so fascinating is their medical importance. Okay. You know, we have fungi to thank for penicillin, right. a true lifesaver. Yeah. But then there's athlete's foot, which is not so pleasant. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they have a good side and a bad side. Yeah, for sure. But what really stands out to me is their cellular structure. Oh, yeah. Their cell walls contain chitin. Yes. The same material found in the exoskeletons of insects. Isn't that cool? It's like they have a little insect connection. They do. And here's another one for you. Okay. A lot of fungi have these really interesting cells called dicaryotic cells. 
dicaryotic. They have two nuclei in each cell. Two nuclei. Boo. Wow. Uh, That's like having two sets of blueprints for building a house, which I guess would give you a lot more flexibility and adaptability. It would. And it's thought to be one of the reasons why fungi are so successful okay. at adapting to so many different environments. That makes sense. Yeah. And while some fungi, like the ones used to make penicillin, are beneficial, mm -hmm. others can be harmful. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, have you ever heard of Histoplasma capsulatum? I have. This fungus is found in bat droppings. Oh, yeah. And it can cause serious respiratory infections. You don't want that. Definitely a good reason to avoid bat caves. Yeah, I'd say so. But this kind of brings up an interesting point. What's that? Developing antifungal medications must be really tricky. Oh, yeah. Because human and fungal cells are so similar. It's a major challenge. Targeting the differences is super crucial. Right. But those similarities can make it difficult to develop medications right. without all those undesirable side effects. You don't want to hurt yourself while you're hurting the fungus. Exactly. But while some fungi might cause us trouble, others are really essential to life on Earth. Uh, sure. Like we can't forget about algae. Oh, the hell? Just unsung heroes of the planet. They are. Pumping out so much of the oxygen we breathe. The foundation of so many aquatic ecosystems. It's amazing. Yeah. And they're not just good for oxygen. We use them in so many products. We do. From agar in labs. Yes. To carrageenan in food products. I love carrageenan. Like ice cream and toothpaste. It's very useful. It's amazing how versatile algae are. It is. But while we marvel at all the wonders of algae, mm -hmm. it's important to remember that this microscopic world yeah. can also have a dark side. Oh, right. Like those toxic algal blooms. Exactly. That can harm marine life and contaminate seafood. Yeah. Those blooms can produce toxins that can cause paralysis or even death in humans if they're ingested. Oh, wow. Nature's beauty can sometimes pack a punch. It can. And speaking of punches, yeah. have you ever heard of red tides? Red tides. They're caused by dinoflagellates, these tiny algae with armored plates. It's true. It's like a microscopic gladiator battle out there. I love it. And those dinoflagellates are just one example right. of the incredible diversity yeah. within the algae world. Exactly. It's like an entire universe just waiting to be explored. It is. And speaking of exploration, there's one more group of eukaryotic microbes we need to talk about. Okay. Lichens? Ah, uh, yes, lichens. Yeah. The mystery organism. The mystery. They're not quite plants, not quite fungi. Right. So what are they? That is the question, isn't it? Yeah. Well, lichens are essentially a symbiotic partnership. Okay. A really close relationship between a fungus, hmm? usually from a group called the ascomycetes. Okay. And either algae or cyanobacteria. So they're working together to survive. They are. In some of the harshest environments on some Earth. Some of the harshest. So it's like a team effort. You could say that, but this partnership might not be as harmonious as it seems. Oh, okay. You know, it was traditionally viewed as this mutually beneficial relationship. Right. But new research suggests that it's more like controlled parasitism. Controlled parasitism. Yeah. That sounds a little intense. It does. Well, it seems like the fungus is getting a lot more out of the deal uh, right. than its photosynthetic partner. Okay. Imagine a roommate who never does the dishes but enjoys all the benefits of living together. Okay. That's kind of what's happening in the lichen world. So the fungus is like the roommate who's always borrowing your stuff. Exactly. But... Even though this partnership might be a little one-sided, yeah. lichens are incredibly important ecologically. Oh, they are. They help create soil. Yeah. They provide food for animals. Mm -hmm. And they even act as indicators of air pollution. It's true. Wow. Talk about punching above their weight. I know. It's incredible. And they're not just ecologically important. Right. They're visually stunning. They are beautiful. You have those Crestos lichens. Yes. That look like paint splattered on rocks. I love those. Folios lichens with their leafy structures. Yeah. And fruticose lichens, huh. which look like miniature trees. I know. It's so cool. It's amazing. You've clearly been paying attention. Well, I try. And here's a fun fact. Okay. Lichens are incredibly resilient. Yeah. They can grow in some of the harshest environments on Earth. Oh. From scorching deserts to freezing tundras. That's crazy. You can find them on rocks, trees, even buildings. So next time I'm out for a walk, I'll be keeping my eyes peeled for these little wonders. You should. They really are a testament to the power of adaptation mm -hmm. and persistence. They are. But I think it's time for us to take a quick break. Okay. 
gather our thoughts. Sounds good. Before we continue our eukaryotic adventure. I agree. It's been a fascinating journey so far. It has. Let's take a moment to reflect on all we've learned about these incredible eukaryotic microbes. Yeah, good idea. Welcome back. Back to the eukaryotic microbes. It's really amazing how much diversity we've seen, you know, in just these first few groups is, of eukaryotic microbes. We've gone from, you know, those tiny parasites like Giardia that wow. can just, you know, oh, yeah. wreck our digestive systems uh -huh. to these gigantic tapeworms. Oh, yeah. That can be longer than a car. Longer than a car. It's wild. It's crazy. And then and and, and and don't forget those fascinating dicaryotic cells and fungi. Oh yeah. Having two nuclei in one cell. It's crazy. It really is like having two sets of blueprints. Yeah. Giving them incredible flexibility and adaptability. So they're like Amazing. Always prepared no matter yeah. what the environment throws at them. Exactly. And speaking of challenges, okay. let's circle back to parasites for a minute. Okay. We've talked about, you know, their impact on human health. Right. But they also play this really fascinating role in the balance of ecosystems. Okay. Like, take Schistosoma, for example. Yeah. Did you know that their life cycle actually involves snails? Snails? Yeah. Okay, I gotta hear this. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So Schistosoma larvae, mm. they need a specific type of freshwater snail okay. to complete their life cycle. So they can't just... They can't just do it on their own. Live anywhere? No. Okay. They have to infect the snail. Right. They multiply within the snail. Okay. And then they really release a new generation of larvae oh, wow. back into the water, which can then infect humans. So the snails are like little parasite factories. In a way, yeah. Wow. So controlling snail populations okay. can actually be a key strategy Ice. in preventing schistosomiasis. That makes sense. You know, this can involve things like introducing snail predators. Oh, wow. Or making habitats less suitable for snails to thrive. So we're like... We're kind manipulating of manipulating the ecosystem we, for yeah. prevent disease. A little bit, yeah. It's wild. It's incredible how interconnected everything is. It is. You know, who would have thought that snail control could be a key to fighting a human disease? It's a reminder that understanding the ecology of these organisms mm. is just as important as understanding their biology. Absolutely. And while we're on the topic of interconnectedness, yeah. let's talk about you know, those cellular structures we mentioned earlier, okay. like those chitin-rich cell walls and fungi, Oh yeah, are pretty remarkable. They are. The same materials found in insect exoskeletons. It's crazy, isn't it? It's just, you know, a testament to the diversity of life. Yeah. And how evolution can just it can't. repurpose materials in really unexpected ways. It makes you wonder what other surprising connections are out there. Yeah, like what else don't we know? Right. That's so cool. I think there are many more waiting to be discovered. I think so, too. But. Speaking of fascinating structures. Yeah. Let's dive back into those dicaryotic cells. Oh, yes. Found in many fungi. Uh-huh. Especially those in the Basidiomycota group. Yes. The ones that include, you know, our familiar mushrooms. Exactly. Like those two nuclei in one cell yeah. really blew my mind. I know. It's wild. It's like having two chefs in one kitchen. You know? Right. Could you imagine the culinary masterpieces they could create? It's a great analogy. And the process that leads to these dicaryotic cells okay. is called plasmogamy. Plasmogamy. Where two fungal cells, they fuse their cytoplasm. Okay. But not their nuclei. I see. So you end up with this cell that has two separate nuclei. Right. Each with its own set of genetic information. Wow. So it's like having a backup plan. It is. At the cellular level. At the cellular level. And it's thought to give fungi a real evolutionary advantage, yeah. allowing them to adapt to all these changing environments and challenges. That makes sense. Yeah. And this brings us to another important point, you know. What's that? The medical implications of fungi. Right. We've talked about the benefits of antibiotics. Yeah, like penicillin. Like penicillin. Okay. But treating fungal infections can be really tricky. It can. Because human and fungal cells are so similar. They are very similar. Mm. Finding medications that target the fungus without harming the host Right. Is a real challenge. It's like trying to separate two peas in a pod. It is. But researchers, they're exploring some promising new approaches, uh -huh. like targeting the synthesis of chitin. Okay. That key component of fungal cell walls. Right. Could be one way to weaken that fungal cell wall. Okay. And make it more vulnerable. 
So it's like sabotaging their armor. Exactly. Making them easier to fight off. Exactly. And there are other strategies being explored too, okay. like targeting specific fungal enzymes or metabolic pathways okay. that are essential for their survival. So it's like finding their Achilles heel. Exactly. Their weak spot. Like their weak spot. But let's shift gears for a moment and talk about the ecological importance of eukaryotic microbes. Okay. Especially algae and lichens. Algae and lichens, yeah. We've talked about their roles in oxygen production and soil formation, mm -hmm. and even as indicators of air pollution. Yeah. But how else do they impact our ecosystems? Well, let's start with algae. Okay. They form the foundation of so many aquatic food webs. Right. They're the primary producers, okay. converting sunlight into energy that supports a whole cascade of organisms, Right. from microscopic zooplankton to large whales. So they're the fuel that keeps the engine of the ocean running. Precisely. And then there are lichens. Okay. Those fascinating symbiotic partnerships. Right. You know, because they can grow in such harsh environments. Yeah. They often act as pioneers. Okay. Colonizing bare rock and creating that first layer of soil. Oh, wow. Making way for other life to take hold. They're like the trailblazers. Yeah. Paving the way for the rest of the ecosystem to develop. Exactly. And they're also incredibly sensitive to changes in air quality. Right. Acting as valuable bioindicators of pollution levels. So it's like having a built-in environmental monitoring system. It is. You know, by analyzing their tissues, yeah. scientists can get a sense of the overall air quality in an area. It's amazing how these seemingly simple organisms <laughs> can have such a profound impact on our world. It really is. And it underscores the importance of understanding and protecting these microscopic ecosystems. Absolutely. But let's bring it back to our everyday lives. Okay. How do these eukaryotic microbes directly impact us well as we've discussed yeah you know some parasites can cause some serious diseases right and fungal infections can be so difficult to treat yeah but let's not forget the positive side right you know fungi give us those life-saving antibiotics like penicillin right. and algae are being explored for their potential in biofuels oh wow pharmaceuticals yeah. and even food production so they're not just essential for the planet's health they're not. But for our well-being, too. Absolutely. And as we continue to study them, yeah. we're likely to uncover even more ways that they can benefit humanity. It's like we're just starting to understand I think so. the incredible potential of these tiny organisms. Exactly. And that brings us to a really thought-provoking question. What would our world be like without these eukaryotic microbes? Now, that's a question that really makes you stop and think. It does. Yeah. It's hard to imagine our planet without them. I know. You know, they're so deeply intertwined with every aspect of life on Earth. It's true. Without algae, we'd lose a significant portion of our oxygen supply. Exactly. Without fungi, we'd lose those essential decomposers right. that break down organic matter and recycle nutrients. It's true. And without lichens, yeah. those pioneers of barren landscapes mm -hmm. would be missing. Right. And the formation of new ecosystems would be severely hampered. It would. Our world would be a drastically different place. Yeah. And it's likely that many life forms, including humans, right. wouldn't be able to survive. It's true. <laughs> it is humbling to realize just how much we rely on these tiny organisms yeah. that we often take for granted. It's a reminder that we're all interconnected. Yeah. From the smallest microbe to the largest animal. And that we need to respect and protect that delicate balance of life on Earth. Well said. Yeah. And as we delve deeper into this microscopic realm, yeah, I'm sure we'll uncover even more wonders and mysteries. I'm certain of it. I'm ready for more, but I think we need to take a short break. Okay. Just to let all this information. Yeah, let it sink in. Sink in. Join us in part three. All right. As we wrap up our eukaryotic adventure and explore the future of this fascinating field. Welcome back to our deep dive. I don't know about you, but I'm still processing well, me too. all this incredible information Yeah. about eukaryotic microbes. There's so much to learn. There is. We covered everything from those microscopic parasites oh, yeah. that can cause you know, serious illnesses right. to those beneficial fungi that give us life-saving antibiotics. Uh -huh. And of course, we can't forget about the algae. The algae. That are responsible for a huge chunk of the oxygen we breathe. It's true. And and those lichens too. Oh, the lichens. Incredible partnerships. Yeah. Thriving in some of the most extreme environments. Like they're the ultimate survivors. They really are. It just makes you realize that 
there's so much more to the world than what we can see. Uh, absolutely. With just our eyes. You know? It really does. And, and it kind of brings us to what I think is the most important question. Okay. What's that? What can we learn from these eukaryotic microbes? I'm ready. Well, for starters, yeah. they really teach us about the interconnectedness of life. Right. Everything's linked, you know, from those microscopic algae that form the base of aquatic food webs yep. to, you know, those large animals that depend on them for survival. So it's like a giant intricate web. It is. Where every thread is important. Every thread. And eukaryotic microbes also teach us about resilience. Oh, yeah. How so? Well, think about those lichens clinging to bare rock, mm -hmm. slowly breaking it down yeah. and creating soil. Right. They're really a reminder that even in the harshest conditions, yeah. life uh, finds a way. It's inspiring. It is. Like they show us that we can overcome challenges and thrive even when things get tough. Absolutely. And, you know, they also teach us about the importance of diversity. Okay. The world of eukaryotic microbes is incredibly diverse. Yeah. And each species plays a unique role. Right. This diversity is what makes ecosystems so resilient and adaptable. So it's like a well-balanced team. Uh, okay. With everyone contributing their own special skills. Exactly. And just like a team, we need to protect and value every member. Right. And, you know, the more we learn about eukaryotic microbes, mm -hmm. the more we realize how essential they are for the health of our planet yeah. and for our own well-being. Absolutely. <laughs> so what can we do to make sure that these microbial communities thrive? Well, one of the most important things we can do yeah. is protect our environment. Of course. Pollution, climate change, habitat loss. Yeah. All threaten these delicate ecosystems right. by taking steps to reduce our impact on the planet. We can really help ensure that these microbes continue to flourish. That makes sense. Yeah. And I imagine continued research is crucial, too. Absolutely. The more we learn about eukaryotic microbes, yeah. the better equipped we'll be to understand their roles in the environment right. and develop solutions to the challenges they face. It's like we're just scratching the surface of what these organisms can teach us. We are. Who knows what amazing discoveries are waiting to be made. I know. Maybe new antibiotics. Maybe. Innovative biofuels. Mm -hmm. Or even solutions to some of the world's most pressing environmental problems. Absolutely. It's so exciting to think about all the possibilities. It really is. As we wrap up this deep dive, yeah. I just can't help but feel this sense of awe and wonder yeah. at the complexity and the beauty yeah, is. of the microbial world. Yeah, a huge thank you to all of our listeners. Yes, thank you. For joining us on this incredible journey. It's been fun. Into the world of eukaryotic microbes. Yes. We hope you gained a newfound appreciation for these tiny but mighty organisms <laughs> and their vital role in our lives and on our planet. They are vital. And remember, there's a whole universe waiting to be discovered right under our noses. Keep exploring. Keep questioning. Keep learning. And keep diving deep. <laughs>